Hi, this will be a short video detailing the implementation of an efficient floating point complementer for the combined integer floating point data path in the VR4300 CPU for an N64. We should first go over what exactly a complementer is. You may recall from a previous video that the IEEE 754 floating point standard looks something like this. A single precision floating point number occupies a 32-bit word with 1 bit for the sign, 8 bits for the exponent, and 23 bits for the fraction or mantissa. The relevant part of this format for this video are the sign and fraction, which together allow for a number to exist in sign magnitude form, which is in contrast to the two's complement form. Notice how in the signed magnitude form, the only difference between the positive and negative number is the value of the sign bit. Consider the following floating point operations for two numbers a and b. For simplicity, let's assume that a and b are both positive and a is bigger than b. All of these operations can be done with a binary adder with minor manipulations like so. Notice how all of the operations are additions, either of positive or negative numbers. Since both a and b are positive numbers in signed magnitude form, then the negative version is the same number transformed into its negative two's complement form. This transformation is typically done using an XOR gate and the carry in bit of the adder, which is straightforward. Also notice that in the case of negative a minus b, the result is identical to the a plus b case with the sign bit being flipped. While this seems straightforward, there is a problem here. The first three operations will always be in a signed magnitude form for a larger than b. However, the fourth operation would result in a negative number. Since binary adders typically operate on the two's complement form, the output will be two's complement and not signed magnitude. And hence, this is where floating point hardware will typically contain a component called a complementer, which is responsible for taking the two's complement output of the binary adder and transforming it into the signed magnitude representation. While this may seem like an easy step, the question is how to implement one in the data path so that the propagation delay is minimized and the resource usage is also minimized. A typical binary adder capable of performing two's complement binary addition and subtraction will look something like this. Notice how the subtract flag connects to both the carry n to add 1 and the XOR gate for b, which allows for the operation a plus b and a minus b. For now, let's abstract this circuit away into a single unit. Here we have a single adder which takes the inputs a and b as well as subtraction and produces the result r. Remember that the problem we are trying to solve is how to negate the result r if we are doing a floating point operation and the result r is less than zero. There are a few obvious solutions to the problem. The first option is to place an inversion step after the primary binary adder. This inverter will only invert the result if the result is less than zero, and we are also doing a floating point operation. Notice that the other input to the inverting adder is zero, which means that we are not using a full adder, but a reduced one. On the top is a full adder circuit, while below is the reduced version setting the input A to zero, which is also known as a half adder. Obviously, the reduced adder will require fewer resources in the FPGA and will have a shorter propagation delay. The next option is to duplicate the full adder and simultaneously perform A minus B and B minus A, then select the non-negative output result via a multiplexer. This is a valid approach and will have a shorter propagation delay than the previous case, with an increased resource usage since there are two full adders. Note that an adder in general does not take up many resources, so the increased usage might be insignificant when compared to the entire VR4300. And the third option that I came up with is to flip the inputs to the full adder based on the result. This option will have the longest propagation delay, however, it will most likely use the least amount of resources. There is a slight footnote to add here, which is that the feedback path needs to be clocked. The reason for this is that we have an A-stable logic feedback loop here, which could continually oscillate between the complement and the non-complement states. Adding a clock fixes that issue. However, there is another footnote, which is that the clock needs to be twice the frequency of the processor clock. The reason for this is that the complement flag has to be reset for every instruction and then latched halfway through the instruction to select the required input pair. If this is not done, then it is possible that the result may be complemented when the operation does not require it, resulting in an incorrect result. Furthermore, the flag generation logic is a little more complicated than shown. 
For this reason, this option probably will not do particularly well. Chances are that the first two implementations will operate at the performance required for the VR4300 and for an R5900 for a PlayStation 2. However, I am skeptical as to whether or not the third result will provide sufficient performance for an R5900 but should be sufficient for a VR4300. But the goal is to see how much they differ. So let's get into some synthesis results. As usual, I am doing a comparison of synthesis between an Altera Cyclone 5 and the Xilinx Arctic 7 FPGAs, as in the previous videos. To start off, I have the synthesis results for a full adder, subtractor, and a conditional inverter, as mentioned previously. These can act as base cases for comparison. Notice that the inverter uses almost half the logic units used by the full adder on the Cyclone 5, but has little effect on the Arctic 7. This is most likely due to the way that the adders and the fast carry chains are implemented in their respective device architectures. With that out of the way, let's see how the three options did. Overall, the results were pretty much what one would expect, although I didn't expect to see such a performance decrease when compared to the full adder. Clearly option 3 is not a good choice considering that it has very poor performance and requires an additional clock to help prevent an A-stable feedback loop. Given that the resource usage is relatively small for all of the implementations and the processor only requires one of these units, I think that option 2 is the best solution. There are other options which I did not consider, however, which were to implement a different kind of adder, such as a carry propagate adder, move the complement to another part, such as the shifter, or to split the complementer into multiple stages that can be split over several clock cycles. Out of the three, the only option that could be beneficial for the combined integer floating point data path is that of a more efficient adder. However, the standard arithmetic adder described in HDL should provide the most optimum solution assuming that the synthesis tools are implemented correctly. The reason for this is that as mentioned before, the FPGA architectures contain special sub-function units and interconnects for forming fast addition, which will be significantly faster than anything that would be implemented in the lookup table based part of the logic units. Anyway, I know that was a short video, but it was still an important optimization to perform. The next video in the series should be a bit longer, covering a sticky shifter implementation with floating point rounding logic. Hopefully you found this video interesting. Thanks for watching.